I think we'll get started because we have a very busy agenda today. So welcome to um, this week's ESDR Kitchen Live webinar. Of course, we've been very busy in the kitchen over the last few weeks. And uh, those of you who have not joined the kitchen before will perhaps know that this is uh, these are live webinars produced by the ESDR in lieu of, of us being able to meet face to face. And um, I guess when you look back over 2020, this has been one of the, of the successes that is to bring education and scientific discourse to our members. Uh, we have four themes, uh, the recipe book, which is around new research techniques, which are explained by experts, uh, sweet and sour, where we have two protagonists discussing um, hot topics in um, dermatology and molecular cuisine, where one of our eminent um, members will discuss his or her uh, research career and the paths to um, discovery. Um, but uh, today is one of, of our freshly baked um, episodes and uh, this is a, a real bumper um, batch because rather than having two speakers, we have three speakers today. Um, just to remind you that um, this and subsequent um, episodes of the, our webinars are supported by Amgen. And with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to our uh, chair, chairs for today, uh, Professor Adele O'Toole from London and Professor Ellie Sprecher from Tel Aviv. So, um, Professor O'Toole, Adele, hand over uh, to thank you, Chris. To our speakers. Um, so, I'm very pleased to introduce the first speaker, uh, Philip Starkel, um, who studied molecular biology at the University of Vienna and did his PhD on food allergy in the lab of Erika. Uh, Jensen Jarlan um, at the Medical University of Vienna. He next joined the lab of Stephen Galley at Stanford uh, to investigate allergic uh, immune responses in the adaptive immune response against uh, venoms. Since 2015, he is back in Vienna um, at the Medical University and CEMM, uh, the research center of the Austrian Academy of Sciences. He's now a senior postdoc in the lab of uh, Sylvia Nath, and he works on different aspects of type 2 immune responses, including the interplay between bacterial infections and allergies. And he's going to speak about his uh, recent uh, publication um, in immunity. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, write them on the, the chat and we will collect them at the end of the session and ask the questions to all three speakers at the end of the session. Uh, so, um, Philip, can I invite you to share your presentation? Thank you. So, um, yeah, good afternoon and Mahlzeit. Many thanks for the kind introduction, Adele. I'm very thankful to the ESDR for this exciting opportunity. Um, the meal that I prepared for you today combines some exotic flavors from allergies and bacterial infections. And I personally think that it's quite intense and tasty and I hope that you will enjoy it as well. So just a second. So one of my major research interests are type two immune responses. And um, this branch of adaptive immunity, it plays an important physiologic role, for instance, in host responses against parasites and also repair of damaged tissues. However, type two immunity is probably even better known for its dark side, and that's the critical contribution to allergies. Allergies and type two immune responses are associated with the occurrence of T helper type two cells or TH2 cells, that are characterized by the production of so-called type two cytokines, such as interleukin-4 or IL-13. And these cytokines then act on B cells where they induce an antibody class switch, leading to the production of antigen-specific IgE antibodies. These IgE antibodies bind to um, effector cells that express a high affinity IgE receptor, FCEPSONR1, most importantly, tissue resident mast cells, and also a rare um, cell type found in the circulation called basophil. Antigen exposure of such Ig sensitized effector cells via IgE results then in the immediate release of preformed and newly synthesized compounds which cause allergic reactions and inflammation. 
given that allergies affect so many people and that they can be life-threatening in extreme cases, the question, why do we actually have this module of immunity responsible for allergic reactions is of major interest. So one um, very controversial answer was postulated more than 25 years ago by Margie Prophet. In her so-called toxin hypothesis, Prophet provided compelling arguments for a function of allergic reactions as defense mechanisms against noxious substances such as venoms. Remarkably, the toxin hypothesis has been largely neglected by the scientific, scientific community until recently, possibly due to the lack of experimental evidence by the time it was um, published. Today, there's actually quite a profound body of evidence showing that in an innate setting, mast cells can play an important role in host defense against the venoms of honeybee, um, scorpions, and different reptiles, which is clearly illustrated by increased mortality of mast cell deficient mice upon envenomation. This evidence is also nicely covered and summarized in these two reviews. During a postdoctoral stay with Stephen Galley at Stanford University, I teamed up with Thomas Marichal, who is now a PI in Liège, to investigate the toxin hypothesis. And we did this by using mouse models in combination with bee and snake venom. In summary, our studies showed that sublethal doses of um, bee venom and Russell's viper venom induce an allergy-like type 2 immune response characterized by the development of antigen-specific IgE antibodies. However, while IgE antibodies against venoms are commonly considered rather detrimental due to the increased risk of anaphylaxis, we observed in our experiments that IgEs and IgE effector mechanisms were not increasing mortality against high-dose venom challenge, but on the contrary, they were actually important factors of acquired host defense against these two venoms. After this astounding discovery, I wondered whether this powerful defense module consisting of IgE-sensitized mast cells could also make uh, relevant contributions to host defense against other toxin-producing entities. And when thinking about stimulated-induced type 2 immune responses, um, I personally would not have thought initially about bacteria, as the textbook knowledge is actually quite dogmatic in that bacterial infections rather cause type 1 or type 17 responses. However, a closer look at the literature reveals that there is a quite broad variety of pathogenic bacteria that induce type 2 immune responses, and many of them produce toxins. And if you think about it, some of the symptoms of allergic reactions, such as coughing or diarrhea, could actually also be helpful in the expulsion of bacteria. Furthermore, activated mast cells can also have direct and indirect uh, antibacterial activity, for instance, by release of antibacterial peptides, extracellular traps, or immune mediators. So I got pretty excited about the idea that the allergy module uh, meaning IgE antibodies in mast cells could also contribute to host defense against bacteria, and that's what I wanted to test in this study. The first step was to select the ideal model pathogen for these investigations, and after some literature research, one bacterium appeared especially suitable, and that was Staphylococcus aureus. I assume that uh, probably all of you know Staph aureus pretty well. It produces a large number of different toxins and has high clinical relevance, not only because it kills a large number of people every year, but also because there is quite a strong association of its infection with the occurrence and the severity of allergic diseases, especially atopic dermatitis and asthma. In our experimental setup, we combine two types of Staphorus infection. The first one is an epicutaneous back skin infection model that should lead to sensitization of the mice and the development of IgE antibodies. In the second infection, we change the animals with a severe ear skin and soft tissue infection model, abbreviated ESST, or with a pneumonia in order to test for potential host protection due to the initial immunization via the skin. Due to time reasons, I'm only going to show you the ESST infection related data today. So we found that the initial skin infection leads to a mixed type immune response reflected by the production of increased levels of type 1, type 2, and type 17 cytokines by lymph node cells from infected mice. The skin-induced immune response also led to increased levels of serum IgG1 and IgE antibodies specific for compounds present in the culture supernatant of Staph aureus, so presumably toxins. 
this immune serum also uh, strongly increased the degranulation response of um, mast cells upon exposure to culture supernatant. And this increased response could be blocked again when we pretreated the immune serum with an anti-IgE antibody that interferes with the binding of IgE to FC epsilon one We next tested whether this immune response influences the resistance against ESST infection. And indeed, we found that immunized mice showed significantly less bacteria in the ear and also in the draining cervical lymph nodes. And, and in addition, the mice also showed a delayed tissue loss one week after start of the infection. These results show that the skin-induced adaptive immune response induces specific IgE antibodies and increases host defense. We now had all the critical tools in our hands to test the role of the allergy module in defense against bacteria. Using the same experimental setup that I just described, we next use different genetically modified mouse strains to address the contribution of different humoral defense compartments. Using IgE deficient mice, we observed that only wild type mice, but not those mice that could not produce IgE antibodies were able to acquire increased resistance against ESST infection. Similar experiments with mice that lack the FC epsilon one alpha and therefore don't possess a functional high affinity IgE receptor revealed the importance of IgE effector cells for host defense against stuff in our model. We next tested the role of the most important IgE effector cells, basophils and mast cells, using specific cell deleter models. In these mice, pre recombinase is expressed under control of a cell-specific promoter, in this case, MCPT8, which is specific for basophils. Cree expression then leads to production of diphtheria toxin and subsequent cell death. We observed that basophil deficient mice could acquire protection in a way comparable to wild type animals, indicating an um, only minor contribution, if any contribution of basophils. However, this was not the case for muscle deficient mice as prior skin infection did not lead to increased resistance against bacteria. And similarly, the tissue loss phenotype was also not present in these animals. So these results indicate that IgEs and mast cells can play an important role in our model of host immunity against Staphylococcus aureus. So um, in summary, we found evidence that primary stuff skin infection leads to a mixed type immune response and IgE antibodies specific for Staphylococcus aureus. We observed that this adaptive immune response can protect against severe secondary ear skin and soft tissue infection, as well as pneumonia. And this acquired protection seems to depend on IgE effector mechanisms in concert with mast cells. Due to time constraints, um, I could not show you all of our data today, but as a small teaser, we also found that local allergic reactions in the skin can increase resistance against staph aureus. And we identified different ways of how um, IgE and antigen activated mast cells can counteract stuff related infection and toxicity. And I cordially invite you to have a look at our recent publication in case you want to know more about our findings. So overall, we are pretty excited about this study as it supports the idea that allergic immune responses can actually also be beneficial, for instance, in defense against venoms and pathogenic bacteria. And with my last slide, I would like to acknowledge our lab and our collaborators and all our funding agencies. And yeah, with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm looking forward to your comments and questions during the Q&A session. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Philip. Any questions for Philip, please put in the Q&A or chat and um, we will ask those at the end of the session. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce the next two speakers. Um, so, we chose two papers rather than one because both papers were published in the same issue of the American Journal of Human Genetics. Um, the first speaker is Stefan Haskamp, who is currently a PhD student in the lab of Ulrike Hofmeier at the Institute of Human Genetics in Erlangen, Germany. Um, and the second speaker is Francesca Capon, who obtained her PhD in Rome, did her postdoc at the University of Leicester and joined King's College uh, London as an academic where she is currently a reader um, in inflammation genetics. So we'll start off with Stefan, if you could share your screen, please. Thanks. 
Okay, so generalized post-lapse rises. Um, it's a rare severe autoimmune disease, and it's characterized by multisystemic inflammation and infiltration of neutrophils into the skin. Uh, potential triggers are antibiotics, um, infections, and pregnancy. Um, right. So um, biallelic mutations in IL-36RN are disease-causing in a subset of patients, and IL-36RN is uh, coding for the receptor antagonist of um, IL-36, and its, its deletion or deficiency leads to a, pro a stronger pro-inflammatory signal of IL-36. Um, so in our patient groups of, of 82 patients, um, two-thirds of our patients do not carry any mutation in this gene. So the vast majority um, of cases, they don't have any known genetic factors. Um, we did whole exome sequencing and targeted sequencing and look for genes who have uh, homozygous mutations in at least two patients. And we found a new candidate gene, which is uh, NPO. And as you can see, we found um, four patients with two variants, 13 patients with one variant, and 65 patients with zero variants. Um, when we compare to our control group, so um, which consisted of 1,000 genomes and uh, in-house exomes, you can see that the frequency of the number of mutations in our control groups is um, very much uh, smaller and the uh, association is significant. Uh, Myoli peroxidase is, is the MPO and it's the main neutrophilic enzyme and MPO is expressed in neutrophils as monocytes and macrophages. Um, the protein is located in aerosophilic granules and neutrophils and it's catalyzing the production of hypochalous acids shown below. Um, hypochalous acids have antimicrobial activity. Um, we wanted also to see which impact each variant has. And um, we did a mutagenesis uh, assay in hex cells. So we transfected the wild type, uh, the, ex the plasmid expressing the wild type or one of the mutant variants. Um, you can see that, so we did then an MPO activity, a measurement from neutrophilic, uh, from, from the supernatant by fluorometric assay. And you can see that all variants resulting at least in 50% loss of MPO activity, while three variants need to complete um, MPO deficiency. Um, novel variants are highlighted um, in green. Um, so we sh um, showed that partial and complete uh, uh, variants leading to partial and complete deficiency are associated with our group in our, uh, in our patients. Um, when we have a look and only consider uh, variants leading to complete deficiency, you can see that the association is even bigger. However, partial variants leading to partial deficiency are not associated. So the overall question is how does MPO deficiency contribute to GPP? Um, so I36 is a cytokine and it's a key cytokine in GPP. And like any other cytokine in immunology, they need to be activated uh, extracellularly in order to transmit the signal. And this is happening uh, by cleavage of uh, four proteases. And it's known that MPO may, can regulate other neutrophilic enzymes. For example, for neutrophilic elastase, it has been shown. And um, yeah, the authors in this paper, they speculate that it's because of the hypochalous acid um, that uh, MPO deficiency increases neutrophilic elastase activity. And we, in fact, we could also show that in our patients. So we um, analyzed the um, activities in neutrophilic lysates, and you can see that MPO um, activity negatively correlates with the activity of the four other proteases. Um, so GPP is also characterized by migrating neutrophils into the skin and to the postules, as you see here. Um, so we asked us, uh, us um, maybe GPP patients uh, fail to remove dying neutrophils. 
and um, we wanted to analyze if monocytes um, are able to uh, remove the apoptotic neutrophils shown here and we did this in patients as well as in our MPO knockout mice model and you can see here on the y-axis the number of non-EE neutrophils um, which is significantly different in, in mice as well as in our patients as an MPO deficient patient compared to healthy donors. Overall, um, we identified MPO as a new major gene in GPP. Um, we have several mechanisms um, elucidated. So first, the uh, inverse correlation of MPO activity and other neutrophilic proteases, leading to more active IL-36 and plus more um, inflammation. Um, second, we showed that uh, the aphrocytosis, so the removal of apoptotic neutrophils, is impaired in um, GPP and MPO deficient GPP patients. And what I did not show you because of time reasons is that there's also disturbed net formation at GPP, which also might um, argue in favor of inflammation. So. Yeah, at the end, I want to acknowledge my, um, I want to thank my working group and our collaborators, as well as the participants of the study. And yeah, I'm happy to ask to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Stefan. If you could unshare your screen and then we'll move on to Francesca. Any questions for Stefan, please put them in the chat or Q&A, thanks. So, um, hello everybody. Um, so my group in London has also identified MPO mutation as a genetic determinant of uh, postular skin disease. And like Stefan and Ulrika's group, we started uh, with the whole exome sequencing of uh, 19 individuals affected by GPP. And we found that one of them was homozygous for a rare and deleterious uh, splice site variant that you can see uh, on the left. Uh, we then uh, went on to sequence further cohort. So we looked at 109 uh, individuals affected by palmoplantar postulosis, which as you all know, is a localized form of pustular psoriasis. And again, we found another individual who was homozygous from the same recessive variant we had just identified. And then we moved on to acute generalized exanthemus pustulosis, or AGEP, uh, which is a severe cutaneous adverse reaction to drug, which also manifests with widespread skin postulation and systemic upset. And we found two uh, AGEP individuals carrying uh, recessive um, MPO allele, and the one I'm showing in the panel was homozygous for a 14 base pair uh, frame shift. Uh, deletion. And what was really interesting is that all these uh, changes, these, all the changes that we identified uh, have been previously described as disease allele for a condition known as myeloperoxidase deficiency, which is an, a mild immune uh, deficiency, or MPOD. And so to further um, validate this link between deleterious MPO allele and postular skin disease, we carried out a systematic literature review of published MPOD case, and we were indeed able to find the four individuals who suffered for, uh, from myeloperoxidase uh, deficiency and concomitant uh, pustular psoriasis, uh, with a fifth person presenting with MPOD and pyoderma gangrenosum, which, as you know, is a rare but severe neutrophilic skin disease. So this further confirmed that loss of function, MPO allele, are uh, associated with uh, pustular skin disease. We then tried to understand a bit more of the mechanism whereby uh, MPO mutation um, caused uh, the disease. And what we did was a phenome-wide association study. And this is a study where a single SNP is analyzed against a very large number of phenotypes. And in our case, the SNP was the splice site variants, which we had initially identified by all exome sequencing, and the phenotypes 
were nearly 800 traits that have been uh, characterized in nearly half a million participants from the UK Biobank. And all of these have been uh, genotyped. And so our analysis, which I um, emphasized was an hypothesis-free analysis, revealed that the trait that's showing the strongest association with our SNP was the percentage of circulating neutrophil in the circulation. And this observation was um, confirmed by the analysis of four additional MPOD alleles, uh, which were described in the literature and had been genotyped in the UK Biobank. All four of them were, were very significantly associated with uh, an increased number of uh, neutrophils in the circulation. So this suggests quite strongly that uh, loss of function MPO allele contribute to the susceptibility to postural skin disease through an effect on uh, neutrophil counts. Now, mature neutrophils, as we all know, do not proliferate. And so we hypothesize that the effect on neutrophil count was mediated by an effect on apoptosis. And to uh, further investigate this hypothesis, we uh, obtained healthy neutrophils, uh, so neutrophils from healthy donors, and we treated them with a molecule called ABAH, which is an inhibitor of MPO activity. So in that way, we tried to mimic the effect of uh, disease allele. And we then exposed the cells to uh, PMA to induce apoptosis. So uh, as you can see in the histogram on the left uh, of the screen, uh, the um, cells that were treated with PMA only uh, uh, died, and so their viability decreased uh, as expected uh, very significantly. But uh, the cells that had also been supplemented with the MPO inhibitor uh, died less, so there was more cell uh, viability. And the same um, phenomenon was observed when we looked directly at apoptosis by annexin-5 staining. And we were able to show that apoptotic annexin-5 positive cells uh, accumulated very quickly uh, following treatment with PMA, but uh, there were less of them cells that had also been exposed to the MPO inhibitors. So in other words, MPO uh, inhibition uh, delays or inhibits apoptosis in neutrophils. So uh, I think uh, that we have uh, demonstrated, our study has demonstrated, first of all, that uh, loss of function MPO allele uh, are associated with vascular skin disease, but also in the heterozygous uh, state with uh, increased uh, neutrophil abundance in the circulation. And the effect of this uh, mutation on neutrophil counts and postural skin disease is likely uh, mediated by delayed apoptosis, which is consistent with uh, the data that Stefan has just uh, shown you. And so this is our interesting observation. Of, uh, first of all, they uh, add to our understanding of the genetic landscape of uh, postular psoriasis and postular skin disease, uh, but they also have wider uh, implication. So uh, pharmacologic, pharmacological MPO inhibitors are currently being trialed for the treatment of neurodegeneration, and our observations suggest that uh, these uh, molecules may have some inflammatory side effects that should be monitored quite closely. And the picture on the right is to thank Marta Vergnano, a former PhD student in my lab, who is the first author of our, of our paper and did a lot of the work. And then to acknowledge uh, my group, uh, clinical collaborators and funders. Thank you. Thank you all. This was really uh, uh, wonderful. And thank you for sharing all these exciting data. So we don't have too much time and we would very much appreciate uh, very uh, succinct answers to the many questions uh, we have been uh, we have been sent so one of the uh, the question which is uh, which has been uh, sent by uh, different uh, people in different forms is how and this uh, question go 
to Philip is how do we, how can we understand your data in the context of what we know about atopic dermatitis, the susceptibility of atopic dermatitis uh, patients to uh, staph oils infections? Uh, how does that uh, fit together? Yeah, um, thank you very much for, for the question. It's obviously a very important and very, very good question. Um, I think I think the situation that we investigate in our in our study is quite different from the situation of a topic dermatitis patient or most of the topic dermatitis patients who have chronic stuff or infection. We um, in our case, the animals are transiently infected, meaning that they're exposed on the skin. And because it's not a, a mouse specific strain, the mice are able to clear the infection within a week. So basically they recover and they get healthy again. And then um, they still develop this type two immune response. And it, this is in contrast to, to a topic dermatitis patient who obviously have also some genetic factors that favor stuff or is colonization, a chronic colonization, chronic inflammation. So the, the patients are not able to or most of the time not able to completely clear the infection. And I think that's really one of the main interests, uh, main, main points that are important to consider here. And probably in order to have a relevant uh, comparison in the, to the human system, one would need to show at healthy patients um, and healthy people and see how, the, how there correlates um, this, the presence of stuff specific Ig antibodies to infection occurrence with um, Staph aureus, for instance, and actually there is some evidence from different human studies that also in non-atopic patients, meaning without a history of asthma or without a history of atopic dermatitis, there are 40% of patients which also possess um, Staph aureus specific IgE antibodies. So this might be actually a hint that in healthy patients, this type of immune response might be similarly also protective as we see it in our animals, but of course we don't have immediate proof for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Stefan, this, this one is for you. Um, what do you think about the role of MPO in the regulation uh, of uh, uh, blood vessels uh, or NO? How could that be uh, relevant to the pathogenesis of pustular psoriasis? Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, so I'm not an not a expert in vascular biology. But I think that in vascular biology, MPO is um, responsible for, um, for an increased um, inflammation. So MPO deficiency is desired in, in, in the role of in vascular biology. So I, I cannot really um, yeah, answer that question. Thank you. Francesca, uh... you may want to comment on this one or? Well uh, just to say, I'm, I'm not a vascular biologist either, uh, but of course, uh, you know, angiogenesis is an important uh, component of this uh, inflammatory skin phenotypes. So it is possible uh, uh, that there may be a role there. And maybe a last uh, question because of time constraints. So uh, in your uh, exome sequencing, Francesca, did you identify beyond those mutations in the uh, MPO genes, additional uh, susceptibility genes, which may uh, have contributed also to the pathogenesis of the disease in your patients, or, or is this a single gene defect? No, I don't, I don't believe it's a single gene <laughs> defect. So uh, one uh, of our patients also had uh, a rare variant in AP1S3, which is a gene that we had previously linked uh, to pustular psoriasis. I believe that Stefan and Ulrike observed the same uh, concurrence of, uh, of multiple mutation. And we know, of course, that uh, many people with myeloperoxidase deficiency barely show any symptoms even of immune deficiency. So uh, I'm sure there will be other modifiers that will keep us busy for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Chris, back to you. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for that um, fantastic finish to the year. Three great uh, lectures and you know, really exciting advance in our understanding of dermatological disease. Um, it, all that remains for me to say is that uh, in the um, festive break that the kitchen crew will be working hard to uh, produce a whole uh, um, cornucopia of uh, meals for you next year. 
And um, <clears throat> our first one out of the blocks next year in the kitchen is on January the 13th, where Sinead Langan and Sarah Brown have accepted our challenge to discuss uh, the uh, interactions between atopic dermatitis and cardiovascular disease. Does, it ex does cardiovascular disease exist with atopic dermatitis or not? I think there's going to be very interesting scientific discourse. Um, so all that remains for me to do from, on behalf of the SDR is to um, thank you all for your participation. I think the kitchen has been one of the um, standout successes of what has been, I should say, an interesting year. Um, but uh, stay safe, stay well, and try and relax over the, um, over the break, and we'll see you all next year. Thank you. Bye.